Well, hello everybody and um, welcome to the panel called The War Goes On, Ukrainian Scholars Speak on Security, Development and Regional Cooperation. And uh, this roundtable brings together three wonderful scholars from Ukraine, Volodymyr Dubovik, Pavlo Fedorchenko Kutuyev, and Mariana Gladish, in order to discuss their work on security, development, and regional cooperation, as well as the ongoing war's effect on the Ukrainian academia and research. So let me briefly introduce our uh, panelists. Um, Volodymyr Dubovik is associate professor at the Department of International Relations and director of the Center for International Studies in Odessa, Mechnikov National University in Ukraine. Uh, Mariana Gladish is associate professor of the Department of International Relations and Diplomatic Service at the Faculty of International Relations, Ivan Franco National University of Lviv. Pavlo Fedorchenko Kutuyev is a sociologist and political scientist based in Kiev. He's professor of sociology and Soci sociology department chair at Igor Sikorsky Kiev Polytechnic Institute. And I'm the Vila Budrita. I'm president elect of uh, Association um, of AABS, Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies. And I'm also a professor of political science at Georgia Gwinnett College. And I will be moderating this uh, panel. So I'd like to ask uh, Volodymyr first um, to tell us where you currently are and also briefly reflect on your current research, especially as it relates to the current situation, uh, which would be Ukraine standing vis-a-vis -vis Russia, the European Union and NATO. So Volodymyr, the floor is yours. You are muted, you are muted. Thank you, Dovele. It's a great pleasure to take part in this event. And uh, thank you, everyone, for putting this together. <coughs> and also thanks to everyone who joined to listen in. Uh, well, I'm uh, currently an internally displaced person uh, in a little town in Western Ukraine, uh, in the Lviv region, not far from Lviv. Uh, originally, obviously, I'm from Odessa, and I'm permanently based in Odessa, being a faculty member there. And I hope to be able to return there sooner the better. Uh, but for now, uh, away from, uh, you know, battleground, so to speak. And uh, I'm still doing my research, obviously, here, and I also doing my classes. I had two classes for my students uh, online today. And uh, also, we are doing a lot of roundtables like this one today, and actually several a day, usually. Uh, and then a number of interviews for international journalists, because the interest to events in Ukraine and around Ukraine is huge. So. So it's quite busy also trying to do advocacy work, meaning that we're trying to, with a group of scholars, to uh, put together some demands or at least uh, uh, preferences uh, by Ukraine, what needs to be done to help Ukraine, what kind of weapons, for instance, or what kind of assistance is needed and stuff like that. In terms of uh, Ukraine positioning itself right now, it's an existential struggle. It's basically a struggle to you know, maintain, uh, to sustain our nation state and our sovereignty at this point. So this is a very peculiar moment, obviously critical one, uh, the most critical in our history, you know, modern history, contemporary history. Uh, in terms of in future, uh, we are already trying to think uh, beyond the war, uh, whenever it ends and how it ends. And we obviously hope that uh, there will be some sort of a win for Ukraine and definitely not to win for Russia, but uh, we're trying to think beyond that and see what's going to happen in our relations with a number of other major players, international players. And I would actually leave uh, most of what is EU related to Mariana, because I've noticed that she is planning to speak about EU Ukraine relations too. Uh, but in terms of other players, uh, it's very important for us because, for instance, about NATO, uh, we have for a long time wanted to be part of NATO, and we had these aspirations, and we declared them publicly just on the eve of this massive invasion. But at the same time, we realize, and our leadership now realizes that probably there is no clear path for Ukraine towards NATO membership anytime in the future, in the immediate future. And therefore, uh, there is some thinking or rethinking of uh, our priorities is happening right now. We also know that Russia 
wants uh, Ukraine to drop uh, NATO membership aspirations. And this has become a debatable uh, issue here in Ukraine. It has been debated in the, at the round of negotiations in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's not easy to contemplate what's going to happen because, frankly speaking, it's only membership in NATO which can no longer run provide Ukrainians with viable security, in my opinion, and an opinion of most experts here in Ukraine. But at the same time, we understand the realities and there might be a point in negotiating this with Russia, but we'll see what other points there will be if it is only for Ukraine to not permanently, but for the time being, to, to put aside uh, our aspiration to become a NATO member. That is probably something that Ukrainian society can digest, even though there is a lot of anger about Russian invasion and anything that looks like a concession is way too far, or capitulation or surrender is definitely not going to fly with Ukrainian public states. Other major directions of our uh, relations uh, for now and for the future would be US. Ukraine relations, uh, that is very important, that is a critical partner for us. Uh, there is massive assistance coming from the US. Basically, uh, in the last few weeks, uh, we're getting like $800 million worth of uh, defense assistance from the US. And uh, not to mention financial assistance for humanitarian effort and also to keep the Ukrainian economy afloat. So US is extremely important for us. And if we think about our security for the future, if we choose this uh, path, of uh, looking for some security guarantees from some key actors and, and partners in the West, then the US obviously has to be the part of this uh, arrangement, but it better be more viable than the Budapest Memorandum, the infamous, should I say, Budapest Memorandum of, of 1994. And finally, there are major other players, such as Ukraine-Russia relations. I mean, obviously that's not gonna be any positivity in these relations for, for years to come, because obviously there's so much uh, bad, uh, you know, bad feelings about the whole invasion, which is ongoing, and, and brutality of it, and what Russia is doing to civilians and the war crimes and things like that. So that's actually one of the reasons that Zelensky is not even talking, his team is not even talking about negotiation with Russia anymore. After Bucha and other things, uh, he understands that the climate in the society is really contrary, and contrary, you know, uh, to, 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 to what uh, negotiations would mean sitting down together with Russians. And uh, most Ukrainians see them as butchers, and therefore, like, how can we even sit down with these people? Let them stop firing <laughs> at our civilians first, you know. And uh, so that's a very complicated uh, business there. But uh, we we'll have to be neighbors somehow. We we'll have to be coming up with some kind of workable relation, format of relationship, and framework of relationship. But how it's going to look like, I just don't don't know. And also, that would depend, frankly, on how this war ends where it ends, where Ukrainian troops stay, where Russian troops stay, would it be a ceasefire or would it be a durable peace deal? What is it going to be? Because right now it's too early to say. So I'll stop here so that we can have more of a conversation uh, ahead of us. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Vladimir. Um, uh, and uh, I'd like to go to Mariana next, and also would like to ask where she is now. And uh, also, Vladimir already told us that you focus uh, in your research on the European Union. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in the webinar. It's great to see my colleagues. Uh, I am currently in Lviv. I'm, I was not leaving the country, was not leaving the Lviv. Uh, Lviv. Uh, I am working um, uh, at the university. Uh, we are working in a distant format, so continuing my research and doing other many things like volunteering, helping the IDPs, uh, helping giving the interviews uh, as Lviv is now uh, one of the main hubs for the international journalists coming to Lviv who are of course interested in the current situation. Uh, and of course, uh, this is the hub of humanitarian aid and the hub for internally displaced persons. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, so I feel needed here. Of course, sometimes we do not feel very much secure due to the missile air strikes uh, in Lviv even recently, but though continue and believe in better. Concerning my research, I have been dealing uh, with the different 
aspects and topics of their cooperation in the east of Ukraine with the countries of the Eastern Europe uh, and as well uh, as the Baltic Black Sea regional cooperation. Uh, we uh, recently have uh, finished the uh, project together with the with Volodymyr, the representative of his university, Odessa University, launching the MA program Baltic Black Sea Regional Study. While we were starting it and during the realization of the project, so uh, the cooperation was seen like as something that could be done, could be fulfilled in future, but uh, it's not very much realistic. But the events in Ukraine, the Russian-Ukrainian war, showed that the regional cooperation is a vital, a very important component for further co for further security architecture in Europe, particularly cooperation and strengthening uh, in political, economic, military spheres in the Baltic Black Sea region uh, is important and it has already been shown by the countries which are neighboring Ukraine. For example, Poland has already hosted more than 3 million refugees from Ukraine. So it's, if we compare to the um, uh, refugee crisis or migrant crisis in 2015 in Europe, it's already doubled. In general, it is estimated that more than 5 million people have already, Ukrainians have already fled from Ukraine and most of them are residing and staying in the neighboring countries, mainly Poland, the Baltic states, uh, in Romania, Slovakia, Czechia. It means that the countries of the Eastern Europe, uh, which really understand what does it mean and what it means, the aggression be, being before in the socialist camp and uh, we may say under the uh, Soviet occupation uh, more, for more than 70 years, meaning that they really uh, know what it what it means and how can it can uh, can be escalated. So I mean, if we do not stop altogether, uh, Russian Federation and Putin here in Ukraine with the help when the assistance of all the allies, I mean, not only in uh, Europe, but as well uh, together with the huge assistance of and help uh, from the United States, Canada and other many other countries. So they are uh, very much aware that it can uh, go further Russian Federation can go further, and the next uh, targets for the military aggression could be Poland, the Baltic states, or other even other countries. So uh, that is why we are trying to cooperate more closely, conducting also different roundtables, conferences, in order to discuss how can we further cooperate. So small alliances, such as uh, the uh, alliance which was already for several years between Poland, Lithuania and Ukraine, the Pol, uh, uh, Pol Brigade and other alliance, regional alliance show that they can not only be very efficient and useful, they can strengthen and make uh, be more important uh, within the whole uh, European, uh, within the whole Europe, uh, within the whole European security system. And as well, it can strengthen the eastern flank of NATO. So the cooperation with the countries from the Eastern Europe and within this axis of the Baltic Black Sea region, as we also always call this, it can become a real a safe belt uh, from the further Russian aggression. And uh, now Ukraine is the center of the safety belt, yes and safety zone uh, which prevents uh, further going of uh, Russia. So it means that this cooperation and our MA program also show that the ideas, the initiatives which we, has, uh, we have started, uh, they are really very important. And uh, we uh, are intended our university are intended to further cooperate and enhance the cooperation with the universities of the, first of all, Eastern Europe, Baltic countries, 
and other uh, universities in Europe and not only in Europe as well. So that's shortly about the research. Thank you. All right, um, thank you so much, Mariana, and um, very interesting insights. And let me go to uh, Pavlo now. And uh, I would also like to find out um, where you currently are and also if you could uh, reflect on your recent research, uh, especially as it relates to the current situation. I understand that you're working on uh, imagining um, the challenges that Ukraine will face after the war will end. So we will be really interested in hearing about your current work as well. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Well, uh, since the beginning of Russian invasion, uh, uh, I've been based in the Kyiv regions, uh, approximately uh, 50 miles down to the south from Kyiv. Uh, it's away from fighting, and my family now, uh, my wife and uh, nine-year-old daughter are refugees uh, uh, in one of the EU uh, member countries, which is obviously heartbreaking. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, uh, pretty busy uh, here because uh, uh, after the first uh, shock of the war, uh, we devoted the second part of the march uh, to reconnecting with our faculty, staff and students. And uh, at the beginning of uh, April, we resumed teaching online. In fact, well, we had been teaching online uh, for two years in a row uh, due to COVID restrictions. But then there was this break caused by the war. And then uh, uh, we've been up and running. Uh, for over two weeks uh, already. And uh, my department of uh, sociology office degrees in well, sociology, obviously, but with a concentration in uh, conflict resolution and mediation. And I think these are kind of vital uh, concerns, vital, vital undertakings. Uh, uh, so again, it's been stressful, but uh, pretty busy time uh, running department uh, and helping students uh, cope uh, both with uh, uh, shocks and anxieties uh, caused by the war uh, and also uh, cope uh, with the learning process because uh, uh, it's uh, really uh, motivating. Uh, uh, to see how students are interested uh, in attending classes uh, whenever they can, because uh, quite a few students don't have an internet access. Uh, uh, they have to move around. Uh, some of them, unfortunately, are still uh, in occupied territories, territories occupied by Russian troops. Uh, some of them uh, are moving westwards uh, to European Union nations. Uh, but those who can attend lectures uh, are really eager to learn and they're really enthusiastic uh, about interacting with professors. Uh, and uh, we make recordings of our lectures and upload them on our distant uh, learning uh, platforms. And as far as uh, my uh, research is concerned, uh, I've been concerned with modernity, modernization, develop development, and the role of state in these processes uh, over the last uh, quarter century. And um, I'm really pleased uh, to see uh, the notion or term or concept of development uh, as a part of the title of uh, today's event. Uh, and uh, if I'm asked uh, how the issue of development uh, has been dealt with in Ukraine uh, in the uh, last decades, my answer would be very short and blunt, uh, in a very unsatisfactory manner. Uh, the thinking, uh, both thinking and the policy making, uh, as far as uh, development and modernization are concerned, uh, they have been uh, very chaotic and uh, uh, rather done in a uh, peace uh, meal fashion. And the project I've been uh, contemplating over uh, for a relatively long time, and uh, it received a pretty strong push uh, because of uh, these tragic uh, events uh, which are unfolding before eyes uh, because of the Russian war on Ukraine. So uh, I know my concern is how to relaunch modernization project in Ukraine after the war, because it's critical not only to win on the battlefield, it's crucial uh, to win the peace uh, after the war uh, has ended. 
so uh, tentatively, my project uh, could be titled as uh, modernizing uh, the Ukrainian state uh, while modernizing Ukrainian democracy. Because traditionally, you know, these two uh, uh, strands of thinking uh, uh, have been uh, separate. Uh, you've got state builders and uh, you've got people consent with uh, uh, participatory strong uh, democracy. And it's critical to combine both because you, what Ukraine is, is a strong, efficient, effective uh, state capable of reinventing itself, getting rid of corruption and capable of implementing comprehensive and systemic project of uh, development, uh, modernization, while, sorry, it's a, sorry, it's a timer uh, uh, to, to check myself. Uh, I'll be wrapping up. Uh, but on the, uh, on the one hand, so we need a strong state uh, to launch uh, comprehensive project of economic development, overall societal development. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the advantage of Ukraine uh, has been that it's a, a pluralistic society uh, uh, trying uh, to build a viable democracy. Uh, so you have to rebuild uh, the ship uh, of the state uh, while being at sea. Uh, and at the same time, we have to maintain, we have to buttress uh, democratic uh, institutions and practices. This is a very uneasy task. And uh, uh, kind of as a part of my research, uh, I will be trying to deal with both practitioners, academics, uh, conducting in-depth interviews on uh, how do they perceive of uh, things like uh, 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 state modernization, modernity, modernization uh, itself. Uh, how do they think uh, uh, these uh, uh, things can be combined with uh, uh, democratic uh, development? Uh, so it will be a project uh, which will start with theory building, but then gradually, eventually, it will be uh, transformed into something more practically oriented and hopefully uh, uh, into something with the uh, a uh, high degree of uh, uh, policy relevance and uh, uh, even uh, policy outcomes uh, uh, which could be implemented into the real world of politics and uh, uh, policy making. This is in the nutshell uh, what I've been doing and what I'm uh, hoping uh, to continue doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Pavel, and thank you so much for sharing uh, about um, your students. I mean, it's very impressive. I think everybody would agree that the work still goes on, you know, despite everything that's happening. Um, so I would like to ask Volodymyr, um, your university based in Odessa, we hear in the news that this is such a strategic location, so important. So could you tell us a little bit What's going on with your center? What's going on with people around you, with your students, your colleagues? Right, well, I mean, uh, the situation in Odessa is uh, slightly better, I mean, in a major way, better than many other places uh, in uh, other parts of Ukraine, definitely in the south and east of Ukraine. So uh, we are, we have been spared the massive bombardment that many other cities went through. Uh, and of course, when I think about the Kharkiv University, for instance, where a few departments are destroyed, and uh, some, many of my good colleagues had to move out of Kharkiv, and they basically don't have much to return to, or not to mention Mariupol University, of course, where you have very good friends and colleagues, and one of them uh, I just strolled through the participants of our round table and he's seeing that Sergei Pahomenka is here, a good friend and colleague, uh, and also a member of participant of our project that Mariana has mentioned uh, on the Baltic Black Sea cooperation, security cooperation. Uh, he is from Mariupol, barely escaped from there. We're really glad that he did. And uh, right now we're having some good news. I mean, relatively good news about the Mariupol State University probably be, mm -hmm. being moved like it was with several other universities uh, in the east of Ukraine after 2014, uh, that they will probably find a new home uh, somewhere else. But of course, it's all so far relative and uh, so far pending on funding and everything like this. So if you compare to Mariupol, Kharkiv, Sume, for instance, uh, Odessa is on 
much better situation because uh, we did have some shelling and some missiles flying, but basically no major destruction in the center of the city. Uh, mostly infrastructure had been hit and also battleships coming closer to, to Odessa, but not anymore since uh, cruiser Moskva went down, of course. Obviously, they are more cautious in terms of coming closer to the uh, coast of, uh, of the Black Sea and the northern littoral of, of the Black Sea. So uh, the students are struggling, professors as well. I mean, we're all in different places. Uh, I'm not asking, like I had two classes today. Uh, we basically pursue this don't ask, don't tell policy <laughs> when I'm not uh, asking them where they are and they're not, they're not, asking, they're not asking me when they're showing up for the classes and for them to complete the course, especially for the, the year which is graduating this year. Uh, this is very important for them to complete the course and get their degrees and diplomas in time. Uh, the future is uncertain, uh, not only in coming weeks, but in the months. Uh, the financial situation with uh, post-secondary education and university education is gonna be complicated. We're already seeing signs of that, meaning that uh, many students are not uh, paying for their education. Uh, there is a huge backlog with paying tuition. Uh, for obvious reasons, some people are out of town, some people have uh, parents who lost their jobs and they're not capable of paying. So uh, a lot of our uh, positions, uh, professors' positions uh, in my university are depending on those money incoming into the budget of the university. So if there's no money being paid by students, it means there'll be a drastic uh, radical cut in number of positions in the university. So. It's going to be complicated, not to mention, of course, some universities where they had physical destruction, not in my case, but in other places. So it's complicated in many ways. Uh, for instance, the uh, scholarly risk programs, there are many now for Ukrainians, uh, but most of them are directed at people who uh, can actually get out of Ukraine and go to certain places, but not all can. Uh, you know, I, I would like to emphasize that. Uh, men uh, uh, in Ukraine between ages of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave Ukraine. Uh, we are actually, most of us are in my profession are actually exempted from mobilization and draft, at least at this stage of mobilization, in this wave of mobilization. So we're not going to be drafted, but at the same time, we're not, we're not allowed to leave, which means that many of those positions for uh, I, for, for example, been personally offered by my colleagues in Europe and elsewhere, I couldn't take them because I couldn't leave Ukraine. So therefore, it's very important uh, that a lot of uh, our colleagues now recognize this fact and now moving to trying to find a way to help Ukrainian scholars and educators who are in Ukraine and find ways to do that. And uh, it's very important um, because actually you have a lot of families here. You have a huge number of refugees, but you have a much, much higher number of internally displaced persons. Uh, people who don't want to have separated families when you have men and women and children trying to sit, stay together for as long as they can. If the Russian troops, God forbid, come closer to the Western Ukraine, then the children and women would still be able to have time to move around across the border into Europe and men would still stay. So for now, it's complicated uh, financially, uh, you know, in terms of human disasters, disunited families. Uh, the first two couple of weeks were most difficult. I was basically struggling with you know, tears, frankly, uh, when doing my lectures, but now we're getting used to it. I mean, as amazing as it sounds, a bit after almost two months of this war, we're kind of getting used to it. We're working in these conditions and uh, that's what it is. And I'm not choking on tears anymore when I do presentations like I'm doing right now and talking to my students like I did in a couple of first weeks of the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vladimir. And um, Mariana, you are, um, maybe you could also talk about um, the experiences of your students and colleagues. Uh, and also um, whether the help that's coming from outside, from the allies of the United States is making a difference. What could be done more to help people who are in Ukraine? Yeah, thank you. Uh, concerning Lviv University, so the majority of the staff, I mean academic and technical staff is uh, physically in Lviv working. Uh, having classes uh, and uh, concerning the students, there is a different situation because uh, already starting from 2014, when actually the war, the Russian-Ukrainian war started, uh, 
Every year, Lviv University, so more and more students from eastern part and central part of Ukraine, more and more students uh, were entering the university. The number of the applicants and the number of the fresh comers to Lviv University each year was rising. And now uh, it means that now our students are in different regions and as well in the occupied territories, unfortunately. So the attitude and uh, as we are trying to, uh, to, be, to work in a more flexible way, because the first thing is that not all the students can um, join the online uh, classes due to the fact that they are in the occupied territories and I know this personally from the students from my group so that they couldn't physically do that. Others uh, are volunteering very much. Uh, some others are already uh, are the soldiers in the army of Ukraine fighting for in the, the east and in the south so they uh, physically cannot and uh, join the online courses. But also uh, there is other thing that our university gave the permission to the IDP students, those that are not the students of our university, but have moved to Lviv, they can join uh, the classes um, because they can see the schedule online, they can join the classes of different faculties and not to uh, fall behind uh, the educational process, even though their university, for example, can't restart the work in a full scale, as for example, Lviv University is uh, now doing that, is able to do that. So the internally displaced students are welcome to join. Uh, you, uh, Lviv University is not enlisting them as the full students of uh, our university, but still there we, we suppose that uh, starting from September, if they will not be able to return to their home cities and to restart work, those who would, lo would love still to continue their education in Lviv University, they will be enlisted. And we also expect a rise uh, of applications, a great rise of application to Lviv University. As, yes, comparing to Mariupol, Sumy, Kharkiv, even Odessa. So the Western part of Ukraine is uh, uh, seen as a more peaceful place. Yes, and, uh, though it's, uh, to some extent can be is a bit exaggerated we do not feel very much uh, safe here but still comparing to these awful shellings that are in Kharkiv in um, Mariupol is just out of question it's something awful what is going on there and just completely ruined the university so we are expecting for the rise of the students, of the applicants and fresh comers to our university, it will mean the workload on our professors will be much, much higher than it was before. Uh, of course, we are also aware, the authorities of the university are aware that uh, we can have the problem of students not being able to pay for their tuition. So uh, in that case, uh, our authorities are just asking to have to establish contacts and conclude as many as possible agreements, for example, within the Erasmus, in order to help the students uh, for having mobility exchanges, yes, uh, to support them financially in that way and also to help them just to, 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 to continue their education. So in that way, uh, in that way, we can uh, help, first of all, not only our students that are from different parts, but the new fresh karmas from already more occupied territories, uh, territories, unfortunately, in Ukraine. Thank you so much, Mariana. And um, uh, for, for, I have a question for, for, for Pavlo. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, that the work still goes on uh, with your students, but um, could you perhaps uh, think about or tell us um, what are your thoughts on the situation in the next several weeks um, regarding uh, regarding the uh, online education? Do you think that uh, what you are doing is sustainable, or do you think uh, some changes are coming? 
Well, uh, I, the answer is contingent upon the battleground, uh, and it will be decided on the battlefield by Ukrainian armed forces, uh, which are defending the country and defending all of us, civilians and uh, academics. But again, uh, Ukrainian armed forces has been fighting both heroically and uh, efficiently. So, and uh, they managed uh, uh, to drive off uh, invaders uh, from Kiev region, having defeated Russian army. So, uh, I do hope uh, and I do believe that uh, uh, Ukrainian army uh, will be able to withstand that onslaught in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass, because right now uh, we are witnessing uh, perhaps, the, well, not perhaps, I think it's a for a fact, we, we know that for a fact, the biggest battle in Europe uh, since World War II. It's uh, massive, it's, it's really massive. Uh, so it's dreadful, but uh, we remain hopeful. Uh, and again, um, we've been uh, doing uh, this uh, online education thing uh, for over two years uh, since uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, started. Uh, we had some little breaks, uh, uh, but students uh, have been studying uh, online. But uh, obviously, in comparison with COVID times, uh, 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 current situation is uh, tragic and dreadful because uh, during even the most uh, strict lockdowns, it was like a vacation, again, in comparison with uh, uh, present day conditions, because uh, people were staying in their homes, apartments, uh, uh, they had uh, all the services available, uh, so they just could not uh, go out much or they could not um, attend the classes uh, on a campus, but everything was available. And uh, we as an administrators, as professors, uh, uh, could uh, visit uh, campus. In fact, as a department chair, I've been spending, uh, apart from uh, uh, the most uh, strict uh, lockdown uh, times, uh, uh, I I've been spending a lot of time uh, in my office running department, signing papers, dealing with red tape, producing uh, some more papers. Uh, and, and meeting my colleagues, uh, atten attending meetings. Uh, so, uh, again, in, in comparison with president situation, uh, uh, those bygone times, uh, they, they seem to be uh, perfectly normal, like uh, paradise, paradise uh, we lost. Uh, so we'll uh, continue doing our things because, again, students are extremely motivated. Like um, yesterday I had a class because uh, <laughs> apart from uh, uh, sociology and political science, I am teaching uh, an introductory course on Asian studies. Although I'm not a student of Asia, uh, but uh, I, I've always had a keen interest in Asian society, uh, uh, particularly uh, from the perspective of uh, the success, their developmental success, uh, modernization success. Um, so I've been given this uh, chance uh, to teach uh, broader university community, student community, uh, to deliver that uh, introductory course on Asian studies. And uh, we are having such extensive and uh, very informed debates with my students. And most of the students uh, are majoring in engineering. But they're interested in uh, social, societal affairs, they're interested in history, they're interested in politics, they're interested in uh, cultural affairs of Asian societies. And again, they're extremely well read, uh, motivated, uh, uh, they can uh, argue uh, logically and convincingly, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's so rewarding. Uh, so uh, we'll continue teaching online. And hopefully it will be sus sustainable thanks uh, to uh, heroic uh, and efficient performance of uh, uh, Ukrainian armed forces, volunteers, and obviously support of our Western allies. Uh, uh, my colleagues and I have been discussing uh, uh, different uh, uh, grant opportunities and we've been trying uh, uh, to put together uh, several proposals. Perhaps uh, uh, we could uh, continue with uh, uh, talking about these uh, things with you uh, after this webinar because uh, uh, some um, inroads uh, uh, appear to be pretty uh, uh, promising and fruitful. 
uh, we publish an academic journal, so uh, we continue receiving and reviewing uh, articles. So, uh, of course, uh, there is a huge personal toll uh, on everyone, and Vladimir said that uh, he kind of learned how uh, how not to break down in tears. Um, uh, I cannot boast uh, that uh, I've achieved that stage, and. Um, uh, I am personally uh, going through a family crisis because uh, uh, my wife and daughter are refugees and uh, my wife uh, was uh, so uh, traumatized by that experience of fleeing the war and then moving across the Europe that she said that uh, should never come back to Ukraine. So kind of uh, adds uh, difficulties, personal difficult, difficulties uh, to overall tragic situation. But again, we have uh, no choice but to fight back uh, and uh, to defend themselves and uh, to survive, because uh, what's uh, at stake now is uh, our survival, a collective survival as a nation and uh, uh, individual survival uh, as a member of uh, uh, Ukrainian nation, as a member of uh, Ukrainian political community. And it's not a war of our choice, it's a uh, war, it's war of uh, Russia's choice. And again, deliberately say it's a war of Russia's choice because uh, it would be really unwise uh, to blame Putin only. Uh, Putin started that war, but um, his henchmen, his soldiers uh, uh, have been uh, uh, killing uh, people, uh, innocent uh, civilians, uh, mutilating them, raping them, uh, uh, looting uh, uh, properties, uh, committing these uh, barbaric, uh, horrendous uh, crimes against innocent, uh, defenseless uh, civilians. Uh, primarily against uh, uh, women and uh, children. So it's horrific, but uh, again, we have uh, no other choice but um, to defend themselves, uh, to support uh, armed uh, forces and uh, to continue doing our thing. Because again, I think, uh, uh, it, you know, it was a, a famous uh, uh, book penned, uh, offered by uh, former Ukraine's president Leonid Kuchma, and it was titled uh, Ukraine is not Russia. Uh, so uh, continuing in that vein, uh, we have a broad range of rights uh, guaranteed by constitution, and I think the difference, uh, Ukraine differs uh, from Russia in a sense that uh, uh, although Ukraine is not an ideal uh, state or uh, not an ideal society, but quite a few of these rights uh, are tangible and uh, are being implemented. So we are fighting uh, to protect uh, our right uh, uh, for education, for research, uh, for our jobs. I think it's important. Uh, it gives, uh, despite uh, uh, despite all these tragic uh, events, it gives us some sense of uh, uh, belonging, uh, some sense of stability, and uh, some sense of mission. Thank you. And sorry for being tearful. Thank you so much for sharing. I mean, it's very, very important uh, that uh, we hear that. Uh, it's extremely important to share these ideas. So we truly appreciate your uh, sharing these important things with us. Um, there are some questions that came in from the audience, and uh, I'd like to ask all of you, are Ukrainians as united as the media portrays? Uh, is the sense of unity growing? Uh, what is the media not covering? What's happening that you believe is not covered by media? So uh, I'd like to go to Volodymyr first, and then my, and then Pablo. Right. Yes, there is a huge uh, sentiment of uh, uh, being united in this grief, in this anger. There are many feelings we're going through, many emotions, uh, including shock and fear, and sometimes even like despair and agony occasionally, but uh, the overwhelming feeling still, which is prevailing, is anger, it's deep anger uh, at what they're doing to us uh, for no reason. We don't feel any fault on our side, uh, and we just see this huge, massive, brutal, completely unprovoked, premeditated war also, if you can remember how they played the negotiations, quotations, marks, uh, at least uh, since the middle of December, trying to fool everyone, you know, instead they were preparing for a long time for this massive invasion, now we know that. 
uh, we are therefore united, absolutely, uh, including some people who maybe harbored some pro-Russian sentiments before in Ukraine. Ironically enough, I mean, a lot of us know this, but maybe for some people in the audience who didn't notice this fact, many of them are specifically located in those areas in the east and south of Ukraine, uh, which are the most heavily bombed and uh, hammered by Russians. Mm -hmm. So if you sit, for instance, in Kharkiv in a bomb shelter for weeks, uh, if you came to this bomb shelter with some positive feelings and emotions about Russia and thinking and believing that Russia could be a friend or big brother or something, you would definitely come out of this shelter without any of those uh, feelings and emotions. So it's definitely the end of the Russian world here, any future for so-called Russian world here. Uh, it's just not going to be here. There's no place for fifth column, column either. There are very few collaborants that you can find actually here in Ukraine for Russians when they moved in certain areas. And there, you know, actually, again, you're talking about areas where you actually had most of the pro-Russian sentiment here. So let alone central Ukraine or western Ukraine, where you wouldn't find any of such people. So absolutely united, absolutely united uh, as a society, as a people, as a nation, but also as our government which is kind of unusual for Ukrainians because we are being known for being critical of our government and for good reason. And even before the war, you know, everyone was saying, okay, some of them are incompetent and some of them are corrupt and stuff like that. But right now, you know, ironically, paradoxically, it might sound, but I think our government is working now better than before the war. Uh, they are actually showing up to work. They're doing good work. Uh, they're supported by the people. Uh, there is an absolutely unprecedented, unique closeness, proximity between the government and the leader and the president on one hand and the rest of society on the other. Uh, we support Switzerland. Zelensky. Zelensky feels that support and that fits him, you know, all his charisma and swagger and his, uh, you know, grandstanding sometimes even is uh, fueled by, the, by him knowing that there's his, has his great nation behind him. So yes, there is unprecedented unity and coherence. It might wear down eventually if this is a longer war. I mean, if we continue to lose money and people and, 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 and buildings and cities, that is a possibility. I mean, that happened very much with the previous war, low intensity conflict since 2014. Everyone was very much aroused and angered uh, back in the spring of 2014 and summer of 2014, but the, the war went on. A lot of Ukrainians, frankly, forgot about it. It was somewhere there in the Far East. Uh, you know, it doesn't concern many of us. You know, it's just a very limited number of people who fought there. So that was a phenomenon, frankly, about some Ukrainians forgetting about this war, and not just people in the West, but it was a forgotten war in many ways, and here in Ukraine as well, I'm afraid I have to say. But with this current war, you can't forget it. I mean, it's everywhere. It follows you, like with this old uh, three-year-old uh, boy. Uh, you know, who traveled from Kharkiv away from bombs, mm -hmm. uh, only to be found by Russian missile in Lviv. You know, when one of those missiles apparently gave, got stray and it hit a car repair service and it killed uh, seven people and injured 11 people. And two of them, I think, were in critical condition. And one of them was this guy, you know, this three year old boy. Luckily enough, he didn't go through severe injuries, but that's how it is. You know, the war is with you, whether you like it or not. Even if you're in a safer place, you know, even the air raid sirens, you know, it's kind of looming on you, looming large, and the curfews and other things. And that's psychologically difficult, but we are so far, you United and we are, we, we are, we are. I hope we are, we, are, we will be in such a shape uh, for the weeks and months and years if needed. Thank you. Mariana, would you like to offer your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I can just uh, fully agree with Volodymyr. Lviv, uh, in Lviv, all the regions are represented. We have the refugees from all the parts of Ukraine. And I would say that uh, really there is the unity of uh, Russian propaganda was also div always dividing Ukraine into West and East, showing that the East is more pro-Russian and the West is more pro-European. But now it shows that there is no Western uh, Ukraine, it's only the west of Ukraine, and there is no eastern Ukraine. There is an east of the whole united Ukraine. And many people coming to Lviv for the first time, I mean, fleeing, yes, being as internally displaced per, uh, pe uh, persons, they 
we uh, uh, the Lvivians, uh, the citizens of Lviv and all other state, uh, other cities of the western part of Ukraine, we are trying to do our best to feel them at home because we know that they have come from a very uh, drastical uh, and have gone through awful moments in their lives, starting from small kids uh, to old people. And that also gives uh, all of us uh, the feeling of unity, that the whole Ukrainian nation is a one nation. And there is no division between uh, west and east of Ukraine. There is no division between Ukrainian-speaking people and Russian-speaking people people but but we are all ukrainian and this sense helps us fight further thank you thank you so much this is really inspiring to hear um, such unity uh pavlo would you like to offer any thoughts on this question and perhaps the yeah, question absolutely. absolutely thank you thank you Okay, uh, let me uh, present you some uh, data uh, based on uh, public opinion polls. Uh, you know, armed forces uh, has always enjoyed uh, a high degree of trust from uh, Ukrainian population, but uh, recent polls show that uh, the, uh, the uh, trust uh, to uh, Ukrainian armed forces is nearing 100%. It's around 98%. Uh, president uh, has over 90% uh, of uh, approval uh, as far as his job is concerned. And if uh, uh, prior uh, to the war, uh, uh, the ratio between uh, respondents uh, saying that Ukraine is moving in the wrong direction uh, versus uh, people who thought that Ukraine was moving in the right direction was 70% uh, in favor of wrong direction, 30% uh, in favor of uh, right direction. Uh, after the war, uh, the tables were reversed, and now over 70% of respondents uh, think that Ukraine is moving in the right direction, and uh, Ukrainians uh, are extremely hopeful and optimistic uh, when it comes uh, to uh, predicting the outcome of the war. Uh, Ukrainians believe that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, is going to emerge victorious. And I think rightly so, because again, for Ukraine, it's an existential uh, struggle. Uh, uh, Russia's uh, ideology, uh, Russia's uh, policy uh, towards Ukraine uh, makes every uh, Ukrainian a Nazi. Uh, I, I had always been a very moderate. Uh, I, I had been quite cosmopolitan. Um, I had had uh, quite a few uh, stints uh, overseas, and uh, I had uh, often uh, advocated uh, compromise, negotiations, diplomatic solutions, sometimes even uh, uh, appeasement, and uh, sometimes even concessions uh, to reach uh, peace settlement. Uh, but uh, after what uh, uh, Russians uh, uh, have done to Ukraine, and again, I stress uh, Russians uh, are killing uh, Ukrainians because they are Ukrainians. So uh, it does border on a genocide. Uh, Russian behavior is genocide because they're annihilating Ukrainians because they are Ukrainians, like uh, Jews uh, uh, or uh, Roma and other ethnic groups uh, uh, were annihilated, exterminated by Nazis uh, because they belonged to a certain uh, ethnic uh, religious uh, group uh, designated by Nazis uh, uh, as uh, deserving to be destroyed and uh, removed from the face of the earth. Uh, so uh, again, we have nothing, uh, no other options but uh, to defend uh, themselves and uh, to stay off uh, this aggression. And uh, uh, you may have uh, seen uh, media reports uh, about some uh, um, towns in Ukraine removing uh, example, monuments uh, to Russian poet Pushkin. And uh, I would have never thought uh, uh, that uh, I would have supported uh, such, uh, such uh, initiatives. But now I'm fully in favor of that because uh, 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 no matter how I loved Russian literature before, uh, I would really, uh, I would uh, really not feel uh, myself at ease uh, walking down, for example, Leo Tolstoy's street. With all due respect to Leo Tolstoy, his writings and uh, uh, 
uh, his uh, ideals. But still, he's a Russian writer, and uh, mm, I think for decades uh, to come, uh, there is no place uh, for Russian uh, figures uh, uh, in Ukrainian uh, public sphere, uh, in Ukrainian uh, public uh, spaces, and uh, it's not our fault. It's totally Russian's fault uh, as, a, uh, as a nation. Uh, as a nation which tolerates uh, the oppressive uh, state, which tolerates autocracy uh, with uh, Putin at the helm uh, for over uh, 20 years, it's it's their fault. Uh, but uh, again, uh, as a sociologist, uh, I can understand and explain kind of structural and institutional uh, underpinnings uh, of uh, Russian uh, Putin's autocracy. Uh, but it's, you know, like uh, if you look at the biographies of um, serial killers, uh, for example, uh, you'll uh, find out in most of the cases that uh, uh, they were uh, mistreated uh, during their childhood. But uh, as, uh, as long as they're uh, mentally sane, uh, uh, they stand trial and uh, uh, face punishment uh, uh, for, for their crimes. And this is exactly uh, what Putin, uh, his henchmen, and uh, Russians as a nation, as the state, uh, uh, what they are guilty of. Uh, complacency and support of uh, aggression, support of uh, 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 absolutely uh, barbaric uh, attack uh, on, on, on Ukraine. So, and uh, speaking, again, speaking of prospects, uh, uh, again, do appreciate uh, your responsiveness and your support. Uh, it, it matters a lot. Uh, it's extremely important for us. And of course, it would be great if you could uh, stay in touch and uh, uh, have further discussions, uh, uh, perhaps um, apply for some uh, fellowships, research uh, grants uh, together, because uh, as my colleagues um, uh, have rightly observed, uh, both Ukrainian universities uh, need institutional support, financial financial support, and uh, our students and faculty also uh, need uh, uh, all kinds of support, institutional uh, and uh, financial ones. Because, for example, my university, we've been uh, lucky uh, so far. Uh, we've been paid uh, uh, for doing uh, for our job, for doing our thing, uh, but. Uh, uh, our university administration has wondered that uh, they've got funds uh, uh, to last uh, till May and then uh, no one knows uh, what's going to happen next. And on the top of that, uh, and I, I can understand that, but uh, still, uh, as a member of sociological community, it's uh, kind of painful and unpleasant. Uh, so uh, Ukrainian educational authorities uh, has been shifting their focus and uh, financial commitments away from social sciences and humanities towards uh, engineering, uh, uh, kind of defense, engineering, uh, uh, enhancing our defense capabilities. Uh, and uh, um, that trend uh, is going to continue even kind of speed up and uh, uh, e recent events, uh, Russian invasion uh, has given this uh, policy a new boost. All right. Uh, so um Thank you, so. Yeah. So, so social sciences uh, are going to suffer. Uh, we've been uh, underfunded uh, so far, uh, so we really uh, need uh, support from uh, our colleagues uh, from overseas. Thank you. Uh, well, I should like to say that we are going to fight back uh, this invasion, obviously, in whatever way we can. Some people with uh, uh, weapons in their arms and others, in what we can do as uh, scholars and educators. Actually, quite a few cases I've heard about that my uh, colleagues have went to volunteer for the army and they've been sent back with the wars like uh, you, you are more useful in doing classes and teaching this our new generation of ukrainians you know that's what you can do that's uh, you know other people can actually fight but you are available in such, in such a capacity and they're probably right i don't know in this uh, recruiting stations when they say that uh, but at the same time we are seeing uh, miracles of resilience here in ukraine
uh, I finally understand the world. Uh, we've been talking resilience uh, about resilience for years now, various projects and grants and so on. But now we understand what it means. And so far, this nation is a, is an example of, of resilience, and we are trying to fight back uh, in many ways. And also, it's something contrary to the failed uh, state. <laughs> Again, some people wonder if such a massive crash, uh, crushing strike uh, would happen against Ukraine from Russia. Would Ukraine even be able to sustain it beyond several days? And now we are closing to two months already, and we're still fighting back, and we're vibrant, and economy is working, and even our currency is stable. So it's a miracle, if anything, but that's thanks to uh, Ukrainians' spirit, but also thanks to massive assistance and sympathy that we are getting from outside of Ukraine as well. So thank you very much. Uh, may I also the final word. So uh, even before the full-scale invasion started, all the Ukrainians, many of them, uh, though at least those that are my friends on F Facebook, were putting uh, the uh, logos that you, Ukraine and Ukrainians will resist. That was a warning. And our head of the army forces said that Russia, if you come here, so you will be warmly welcome to the hell. So there will not be a warm welcoming. And now we see that it was real uh, true. So uh, Ukraine, I might say, that has a long history fighting with Russia. Uh, Russia indifferent. So Russia, Moscow, uh, uh, starting already from the 15th century and even before that, with the Moscow uh, Empire, then the Russian Empire, then the Soviet Union, particularly here in the western part of Ukraine, there was a resistance to the occupation of the Soviet army till 1952. So uh, that's the history we have. And for now, we understand that this might be the final, but the very important battle for our independence and for our integrity, sovereignty, and recognition as a real state that have a right and the nation that have a right to exist despite all the claims of Russian Federation and many of the Russians. So uh, we may say that, of course, everything is possible now just to, to be so efficient and effective uh thanks to our allies from all over the world from the united states canada from the con uh, european countries from japan and uh, turkey and many other, other countries that we are getting the humanitarian aid support military support uh, of course we are like to stress concerning the military support that we need more uh, having some insights from the army because I'm just in some way trying to help them. Those supplies that are sent for a week to our army, they are using for one day in order to stand and not to give the possibility for Russian troops because they, we, can, we should understand that there is more, major, many more, I mean, in person Russians than the Ukrainians, but still we are trying and our brave soldiers, among them are our students as well, our teachers. So we are trying to keep this defense line and not that uh, they do not move further. Uh, we, hope very much that in case the war will not uh, end very soon, for which we hope all of us hope very much, we hope very much that we will get still the assistance from the whole democratic world, that they will not just give up and saying that, sorry, we are already tired and let's sit and agree with Russia on something. So that will be a great mistake of all the collective West, we may say. So uh, our just request is just to, to help us to fight the Russians till the very end of this war and till Ukraine's victory. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Mariana. And uh, Pablo, would you like to offer any thoughts for the conclusion? C certainly. Uh, I, I apologize for being verbose at the times, so, so I'll be brief uh, in my final remarks. Again, uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for having us and for pulling off these events. Uh, it's uh, incredibly interesting and uh, motivational, uh, rewarding. Uh, and kind of gives extremely strong impetus uh, to our morale, kind of morale boosting event, uh, but also about our thinking because it's uh, a priceless uh, exchange uh, uh, with uh, colleagues here uh, about current situation in Ukraine uh, and uh, ways out Ukraine's uh, future. And as a scholar, uh, you have to be concerned with what's going on, but with also our prospects, with uh, our future. And uh, I couldn't have agreed more with my colleagues, uh, with uh, their uh, ideas and statements that uh, mm, I know our uh, primary concern is uh, to win the war. Uh, we have no other choice but to win the war. To win the war, we need uh, all kinds of uh, support and assistance. Again, primarily uh, assistance in terms of hardware, military hardware, and it, it has to be uh, not just uh, 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 manual weapons, uh, uh, but uh, heavy weaponry, uh, long range uh, artillery, uh, missiles, uh, uh, so we could uh, hit uh, targets in Russia's rear, we could uh, continue sinking uh, Russian uh, naval uh, ships, so we can inflict uh, pain and damage on Russian armed forces and on Russia as a whole uh, to make the cost of the war uh, with Ukraine uh, uh, higher uh, for Russian armed forces and for Russian society at large. Uh, only in such a way uh, we will be able uh, to reach uh, some peace uh, settlement, or some uh, compromise at the negotiating table. Because uh, uh, negotiating without uh, uh, successful military backup uh, won't bring uh, Ukraine uh, anywhere. Uh, so we need uh, uh, your support. Uh, again, uh, moral boosting events are also important because morale is uh, in, in incredibly important both for armed forces and uh, civilians. And uh, well, um, I'm really looking forward to the continuing these conversations and uh, hopefully uh, launching some uh, research and uh, educational uh, projects uh, together because again uh, students are eager to learn, uh, my colleagues are eager uh, to continue uh, doing research and we are uh, all eager uh, uh, to come back to a uh, peaceful life. Uh, no one knows uh, what future f f holds for us and uh, when it's going to happen, uh, but uh, we believe that uh, it will happen uh and uh, hopefully uh, sooner than later thanks we would like to thank alicia uh, would like to thank ben gardner hill for also organizing this event definitely many many thanks to our panelists uh, your work is truly inspiring and also would like to thank the audience uh and um again we have another webinar with the ukrainian scholars on the 28th